welcome to That Was Then. For 35 years, God has blessed us to share together as pastor and people on the grow. This series highlights our time together by featuring one message from each seven-year period. The times, issues, and challenges were different, but the faithfulness of God never changed. May you be encouraged and challenged as you share this series of messages. Have you ever been at your wit's end? Have you ever been at the point where you did not know what to do or where to go, who to see or what to say? To have tried your best, done the best you could, seemingly to no avail, no results, no benefit? Well, if you have, you're in mighty good company. For the pages of scripture are packed with pictures of people who literally were at their wit's end. And this being Mother's Day, I found four portraits of mothers in the text who had come to their wit's end. They had come to the point where they didn't know what to do anymore. The first is found in Genesis 3. It was Eve, the mother of creation, and we see her in Genesis 3 listening to that pitiful speech of her husband Adam to God in the aftermath of their sin. Both of them had failed God. Both of them had fallen. Both of them had willfully disobeyed God's word. Both of them had mistrusted God's sovereignty, God's authority, and God's power. Both had done what he told them not to do. But yet before God, Adam took all the credit and gave Eve all the blame. Eve's two sons, whom she loved and had birthed and had nurtured and had trained, now to manhood, could not get along with one another. And every day, their sibling rivalry grew more intense and more violent and more difficult until one day the word came back to this mother, Eve, that her son Cain had murdered Abel in cold blood. What a horrific tragedy this was, like a tidal wave, sorrow swept over her soul. How could she forgive in her heart one son for killing the other? She was at her wit's end. Turn over a few more pages in the Holy Writ in Genesis 21, and we meet another mother who is burrowing through the brown, burning, barren desert with her bare baby boy. She was trying to get back home to Egypt, but she just knew in her heart that she'd never make it. Everything was great for her starting out. She had been hired as a personal assistant for a wealthy woman named Sarah. The pay was good, the benefits were nice, the job was rewarding, and the future looked bright. Until one day, Sarah suggested that Hagar become the world's first surrogate mother and let Sarah's husband, Abraham, impregnate her and then willingly surrender the baby. Well, Hagar didn't like that, but she was a long ways from home and the job was mighty good to her and she really needed the money. So she gave in reluctantly, and after a long and difficult pregnancy, she delivered a beautiful brown baby boy named Ishmael. Sarah wanted him, but Hagar loved him and could not let him go. Her job said release him, but her heart said keep him. Economics said let him go, but a mother's love said let us be. Occupation said turn him over. But love said, keep him close. Sarah put her out and the boy to starve in the wilderness. Now with the bread gone and the water gone and the money gone and the resources gone and hunger tearing away at their stomachs and thirst suffocating them, starvation dogging their footsteps like a hound dog, she put the boy under a tree because she didn't want to see him die of hunger. 
And then she sat down on a rock to die herself. She was at her wit's end. She didn't know what to do. She didn't know where to turn. She didn't know who to seek for help. Only a few pages later, there's another mama by the name of Jacobeth, who had deep lines of anxiety burrowed in her brow, concern wrenching her every moment, twisting and turning her loving face. The children of Israel were being slaughtered in mass by the Pharaoh's cruel edict. They were being drowned in the waters of the Nile by a cruel and oppressive government, kind of like what's happening in our day in the country of South Africa where children are dying every day simply because a government refuses to renege. It's kind of like our day in the streets of Namibia where freedom is being suffocated and undermined by those who do not care for God's children. It's kind of like our day where in the streets of Ethiopia and Somalia, children walk with lipid legs and swollen bellies in the last and final stages of malnutrition. It's kind of like our day. Pharaoh wanted all the baby boys dead. And so it was open season on the baby boys. And here Jacobeth had a two-year-old son who was on the hit list. How could she protect her son? She had done everything she knew how. She had tried the best she could, but now she was at her wit's end. You walk a little further, my brothers and sisters, and there stands at the foot of the cross a mother with the smell of blood filling her nostrils, her heart broken, her eyes swollen and sore from weeping, her stomach all balled up in butterflies and knots. Her eldest son was hanging there against the backdrop of the black blazing sky with spikes in his hands and spikes in his feet and blood and water draining from his side. He cried out in thirst and they gave him vinegar to drink. He was an innocent man, but yet now he had been interrogated. He was compassionate, but now he was being crucified. He was loving, but life was now leaving his body. He was a healing personality, but now his future seemed hopeless. And here stood his mama. In the last moments of his earthly existence, she didn't know what to do. This was her child. His cries were first heard laying against her bosom. The first blood to be shed was her blood when she brought him forth into the world and now he was dying and she wrenched her hands in utter futility and hopelessness. She didn't know what to do. She was at her wit's end. Well, what do you do when you come to your wit's end? I've got good news for you this morning. There's a word from Paul that says, when you're at the end of your wit, when you're at the end of your intelligence, your understanding, your power, your intellect, your intuition, this is the first thing you ought to do. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Well, preacher, what is the peace of Christ? Whatever else the peace of Christ is, the peace of Christ is the umpire of the spirit which enables us to be directed by God, to be led by God, to be guided by God in all of life's decisions. So that whenever we step outside of the will of God, God lets us know by snatching his peace. You'll go to bed at night and can't sleep. You'll have plenty of money, but not satisfied. You'll have steaks in the refrigerator, but no appetite. You'll have a nice car to drive, but can't enjoy it. You'll have a house with a whole lot of rooms, but lonely in every single one of them. You'll have wall-to-wall -wall carpet, but it'll turn into an air-conditioned hell because God snatches his peace whenever we step outside of the will of God. Got a question for you this morning. Are you at peace with yourself? When you give your tithes and your offerings, are you at peace? When you come to worship, 
Are you at peace? When you're at your home, when you're in your relationships, when you're walking in the living room or getting ready in the bathroom or cooking in the kitchen or laying down in the bedroom, on your job and in your relationship, in your marriage, are you at peace? Because if you're not, it may just be God suggesting to you that you're outside of the will of God. I drive an 86 Plymouth Voyager. And if I were to go out from this place today and plug the key in the ignition, try to start it up and nothing happened, I would be a fool to start cursing out Lee Iacocca <laughs> or saying all oh, Chryslers are no good. Because as I'm speaking, there will be Chryslers driving past me. <laughs> what I ought to do is if I put the key into my ignition and nothing happens, I ought to get out of the car and look under my own hood. Because what happens suggests that there's something wrong under my hood. And nothing wrong with Chrysler. Nothing wrong with Lee Iacocca. But there's something wrong with my car. And the same thing is true in our lives. That if in your life you have no peace, don't curse God, don't curse the church, don't say life is no good, don't blame your parents, don't blame your daddy, don't blame your mama, but pull up your own hood. Well, what is the peace of Christ, preacher? Whatever else the peace of Christ is, it's the power to be calm in crises, to be courageous in conflict, and to be confident in the midst of calamities. Because Jesus, no matter what he faced, he always had a peace that passed understanding. One night out on the sea, the storm began to rise, and the billows began to roll, and the breakers began to dash, and the lightning was riding across the black bosom of the heavens and playing its limber games in the open sky. The thunder was rumbling, and the ship was about to go down, and Jesus was downstairs sleeping. And his disciples went down. They didn't understand that kind of peace. They didn't understand that kind of tranquility. They didn't understand that kind of being at, at rest with oneself and one's environment and one's God. And they said, Jesus, don't you care? We're about to die up here and you're down here sleeping. Oh, the master got up and said, oh, ye of little faith. He stepped up on the hull of the ship and looked up at the lightning because the lightning is just his fountain pen. He, he looked over in the direction where the thunder was because the thunder is just the rumblings of his feet. He, he looked at the billowing clouds and knew that the word had said the clouds were the dust of God's feet. And he looked down at the mighty oceans in its turbulent majesty and knew that it was at his disposal. And Jesus said, I'm just a man of few words, so I ain't got a lot to say. Peace, be still. Oh, and he can say that to your life today. No matter what's going on with you, God doesn't need to speak a whole lot of words. All he's got to say is, burn, be still. Problem, be still. Devil, go to hell. God has the power. But then it says, if you're at your wit's end, Paul says, there's another thing you ought to do. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Every day we ought to be speaking the words that Jesus has already spoken. There's no power in my word. There's nothing special about what I say. But the only thing to which God lends his power is when we speak that which he has already spoken. I can give you my opinions. I can give you my impressions. I can dazzle your intellect with Socratic syllogisms, platonic platitudes, 
Aristotelian arguments. I can pose to you Hegel's model of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. I can talk to you about Kant's immutable categories, but none of that has any redemptive value. The only thing that makes a difference in life is when we talk about what God said. Oh, and you will notice it. Have you ever been to a church where the preacher was impressed with his own intellect and he was using parasyllabic and multisyllabic words that nobody could understand without a dictionary? He was taking metaphysical flights into the ionosphere and philosophical flights into nowhere. And whenever that happens, you'll notice folk get real quiet. But then when it gets to the end of the sermon, and he says, let me get back to the Word and tell you what Jesus says. You'll notice some mother way over in the amen corner will stand up when he mentions Jesus and say, talk to me, Reverend. See, our final authority is not Robert's rule of order. It's not Hiscock's Baptist manual. Because the last time I saw Robert, he didn't have any nail prints in his hands. No matter how many rules he has. Uh, last time I heard of Hiscock, he was still dead and had not got up. There's only one man whose word is worthy enough for us to live our lives by. And his name is Jesus Christ. Let me tell you a little bit about the word. This word that's supposed to dwell in us. His word is a traveler's map by which you can find your way home. It's the pilgrim's staff. It's the pilot's compass. It's the soldier's artillery by which we can fight and win the victory against the devil. It's the Christian's charter. It contains the mind of God, the state of humanity, the destiny of sinners, the way of salvation, the joy of the saints. It has light to direct you, food to sustain you, comfort to cheer you. Its doctrine is holy. Its teaching is binding. Its histories are true. Its decisions are immutable. Jesus is its subject. Wholeness is its object. Holiness is its aim. Let it fill your memory. Let it rule your heart. Let it guide your feet. Read it if you want to be wise. Believe it if you want to be saved. But then you've got to practice it if you want to be holy. He said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. What kind of words should we be thinking about? Every now and then you ought to think about what Jesus said when he said, your sins are forgiven. You ought to think about, lo, I'm with you always. You ought to think about, be not afraid, only believe. You ought to think about, if you speak to the mountain and say, mountain, be moved, and have faith the size of a grain of a mustard seed, that mountain's got to move. You ought to think about, according to your faith, be it unto you. You ought to think about, in the world, you shall have trouble. But be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. You ought to think about be anxious for nothing, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And all of these other things will be added unto you. But then he doesn't stop there. He says, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. In other words, your daily walk ought to be a walk of praising God. You know it's all right to listen to Bobby Blue Bland. It's all right about those B.B. King albums that are leaning against your hi-fi. It's all right to listen to Stevie Wonder talk about skeletons in the closet. That's good. It's all right to listen to Luther do his thing. I've been practicing. Boy, I wish I could do it like he does it, but I, I can never get past the woo 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 I don't know where to go from that. But I got that down. Yeah. It's all right.
like to listen to that. But what Paul is saying to us is that you will never be a whole person. You'll never be a complete Christian if that's all you listen to. Because Luther doesn't have the ability to fix your mind on Jesus. Whitney Houston is not emotional about the grace of God. She's not talking about Jesus mending your broken heart. She's talking about trying to get it together on your own and run and DMC and Cool Cool LJ and the Jam Master. They're not talking about Jesus. Some of us go to sleep with that stuff and wonder why in the morning we so tired. It's because all night long, your body couldn't rest, it was jumping. Huh? We listen to that on the way to work. And wonder why we so high strung. We walk in the job. Somebody say, hello. What about it? Good day, Anna. So what? Nervous. <laughs> Shaky. Disillusioned. Paul said, if you want to experience the peace of Christ, you ought to spend some time singing. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. You ought to spend some time singing. Jesus is the center of my joy. You ought to spend some time singing, I want Jesus to walk with me. You ought to spend some time singing blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a fortress of glory divine. I'm an heir of salvation purchased by God, born in his goodness, lost in his love. Somebody says, what you singing about? Then you can tell them, this is my story. This is my song. I'm not singing the blues, but I'm praising my Savior all day long. You ought to spend some time singing, I know the Lord will make a way. Oh, yes, he will. Then he says, the third thing you do when you get to your wit's end is everything you say and do, do it in the name of Jesus Christ. I don't know if you know how much power that is, but there's a such thing in legal terminology called the power of, a t of attorney, which means that you have the right to deal with a person's estate. You have the right to sign their checks. You have the right to requisition their bank account. And what Jesus has given to you, if you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, opened your heart, confessed your sins, acknowledged him as your Lord, received him as your Savior. If you are walking now in the power of the Holy Spirit, you have the power of attorney over his name. Which means that when you get broke, you stop going and begging sovereign. Y'all better hear me this morning. That means when you get sick, Go get your checkup, but know that all the doctor is going to do eventually is give you medicine which will set up the physical condition for your healing, but the healing still comes from God. you got the power of attorney. That means that every now and then you ought to walk up to the counter of eternity and you get there by prayer. And instead of going to the complaint window, go on over to the claims window. Stand up at the claims window and look the angel of prayer in the face and say, in the name of Jesus, I need a blessing. In the name of Jesus, my bank account is overdrawn. And Father, I need you to send me a blessing. Maybe you don't know it, but I know the Lord can bless you. 
when you don't know where it's coming from, he'll send it from somewhere. You be looking on the left hand and the blessing will tap you on the right shoulder. He said, do it in the name of Jesus. See, our problem is we going in our name. <laughs> Listen to me. My name is Lance Dean Watson, Sr. And I can tell the president of the bank that, you know, and he said, so what? <laughs> you said that, say what? I can stand in the face of the devil, coming against him in prayer, and say, now devil, I'm telling you, get out of my way. He gonna say, now what's your next joke? <laughs> because he said, what you do and say, know that your name ain't got no power. The power is in the name of Jesus. He said, he said, do it in the name of Jesus Christ. You know why? Because God hath highly exalted him and given him a name that's above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow and every tongue must confess there's power in the name of Jesus. What kind of power? Wonder working power. At the name of Jesus, uh, somebody used to sing this song. They said, Jesus, uh, I know your love's all around. Jesus, when troubles burden me down, Jesus, my precious king. I used to wonder why my grandmama, sometime I'd come in the room and she'd just be sitting there saying, Jesus. I say, what you saying to him? Jesus. Walk on in the kitchen, peeling rutabagas. Jesus. Yeah, cleaning greens. I know y'all know nothing about that. That's for poor folk. Uh, cleaning greens. Jesus. Fixing the ham hocks. Come on now. Jesus. Uh, 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 working with the fried chicken. Put it over in uh, Jesus. Because just calling his name will do something to you. Uh, you can just call his name. And, and if you're sick, and he'll make you well. If you're dying, he'll make up your dying bed. If you're depressed, he'll get you up. If you're down, he'll pick you up. If you're falling, he'll hold you up. If you're slipping, he'll keep you up. If you're dead in sin, he'll wake you up. Jesus! Is your life in a mess? He'll fix it up. Uh, do you have no strength? Uh, he'll lift you up. Uh, if you're defeated, his grace is still sufficient. Uh, if you're down and out and you're stained by sin, his blood can still wash you. Uh, are you in need of a savior? He still saves from the guttermost to the uttermost. Uh, D. King tells the story that he was in this church and there was a woman cooking some food and she was moaning, you know, just cooking that food in the basement of the church after a funeral. And she was moaning. Mm -hmm. And he said he tried to ignore it. You know, it's dinner time, they're supposed to be eating and fellowshipping, but he couldn't ignore it because this woman was just humming, just moaning. So finally he asked the sister, he said, excuse me, sister, he said, he said, what are you moaning about? And she said, well, Reverend, you wouldn't understand. He said, please. He, he said, I'm sitting here, supposed to eat, and I done lost my appetite because I can't get around your moaning. I, I don't know if you know what that feels like, to be sitting down at a table full of food and somebody come around and just start talking about Jesus. All of a sudden, you lose your appetite. And they say, Jesus is a way maker. And you say, mm-hmm. Feet start patting. Yeah. Hey, legs start to shake. Body start to rocking from side to side. Hot tear comes down your cheek. Oh, that's happened to me in worship sometime. 
waiting to preach, you know, and preachers like to keep it together before they preach, you know. Can't be getting up here messed up. And sometimes the folk have been singing, you know, and they, they be singing about Jesus, and talking about what Jesus can do, and saying, get on the glory train, and, and, and talking all that kind of stuff, you know, messing with me, uh, uh, saying, what shall separate me from his love? And, and, and then chants a choir, get on, get on their notes, and, and, and start to singing about how sweet Jesus is, and how he's the joy of my salvation. And, and the men's choir will come and say, I'm pressing on the upward way, and new heights I'm gaining every day. And the babies will come on and sing, what do you know about Jesus? He's all right. And I'm sitting there trying to hold it together. And underneath this big old road, my legs be shaking. I said, Lord, please let them hurry up and sit down. <laughs> or oh, it's happened to me in the supermarket. Driving up to the supermarket and somebody says on the radio, I, I don't feel no ways tired because he brought me too far from where I started from. And nobody told me that the road would be easy, but, but I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. I, I, I said, now I ain't going to let that mess with me. I got out, you know, and had my checkbook like this, and I'm popping the checkbook, and about to pull the pages out, and walked in, and I got the card. I walked down the aisle and looked on the shelf, and there was the bread. And the Holy Ghost said, he's bread in a starving land. I said, stop now, stop. Can't take it. I walked on around the corner and saw the distilled water. And, and to suit your taste, I saw the Perrier. And, and, and some said, here be water when you're thirsty. And, and before I knew it, tears began to stream down my face. And, and I walked up to the counter and, and, and pulled out my checkbook. And the woman said, do you want a total? And, and I looked down at my checkbook and saw my balance. And, and I said, I don't need a total. Whatever it is, I can cover it. And I thought about he'll provide for you when nobody else will. The king said, lady, tell me what you singing about. It's getting next to me. She said, well, Reverend, I want you to know. She said, everything was all right. I said, my husband died, and my son, our only son, promised to take care of me as long as I live. After his daddy passed away, and he was a good boy, I never had no trouble out of him. He had finished school. He had done his work, and, and he got me a place to stay. He bought me a car, he paid my bills, he gave me spending money. He said everything was fine. Until one day he got killed in a car accident. And I didn't know what to do. She said, so that night, tears in my eyes, I got down on my knees. And she said, I ain't asked God. She said, I told God she assaulted the throne. I, I told God that I ain't got nothing else to live for. You took my husband, you took my boy. Now after I bury my boy, you come and get me. Because I'm ready to go. And, and she said, I laid down that night and sleep came easy. I just knew the Lord was coming to get me. She said, I woke up the next morning and I was disappointed. Because I looked around the room and everything was the same. Said the chair was the same and the bed was the same pain was the same and the hurt was the same and I was mad at God. She said, but strangely enough, sitting there, I heard some singing coming out of my pillow. And the singer said, be not dismayed, whatever be tied, God will take care of you. And she said, I couldn't even stay in the room. I got upset. I said, I'm losing it. 
She said, I got up and went to the washroom to wash my dentures, uh, getting my dentures together, and I, and I turned on the faucet trying to get my teeth clean, and, and instead of the faucet just sounding normal, it, it seemed like the faucet was singing, through days of toil, when hard doth fail, God will take care of you. When dangers fierce your path assail, God will take care of you. She said, I ran out the bathroom. And I said, before they take me to the crazy house, I'm going to at least eat breakfast. She said, I, I got my skillet out and got the pan hot. She said, and, and then I got my bacon and threw it on over in the skillet. And it was supposed to say, shh, and, but, but instead of sizzling like it normally would, it, it seemed like the bacon started singing and said, all you may need, he will provide. And nothing you ask will be denied. God will take care of you. She said, I ran in the living room. And I said, Lord, what's happening to me? She said, and I sat down, and all four walls joined together in chorus and started singing the chorus, God will take care of you through every day. All along the way, he will take care of you. She said, I didn't want to hear that, Reverend. She said, I was asking God to take me, and God was showing me he wanted to keep me. I asked God to kill me, but God was showing me that he was going to care for me. And she said, I sat down and I was crying and mad at God. And all of a sudden, a car came in the driveway. Young man, fine young man. Good hair, beautiful suit, and shining teeth. Got out this car with his briefcase in his hand, looking good. Said, I opened the door and he was smelling good. He opened his mouth and he was talking good. She said, I looked at this fine young man and he came up to the door and he said, ma'am, I know you don't know me, but your son was a good friend of mine. Matter of fact, we were so close coming through school, we were just like brothers. And he said, I couldn't get here for the funeral. My business had me out of the country. But we were friends, we were close friends, and he worried about something like this happening one day. And, and he told me how he was taking care of you and looking out for you. And, and, and he said, if anything should ever happen to him, that I should come by. And, and I know you don't know me, that you've got no reason to trust me, but, but in your son's name, I, I'm here this morning, and, and here's a little check for $100,000 uh, on an insurance policy that he'd taken out, and, and here's my business card, uh, because I don't have a mama, uh, and you don't have a son, but maybe if I be your son, uh, you can be my mama. Call me if you need me. And he turned around, Reverend, walked on down the driveway, got in his shiny BMW, started up the engine, and the engine didn't purr, but instead the engine started singing and said, no matter what may be the test, God will take care of you. Lean, weary one upon his breast. God will take care of you. I don't know how you feel about it, but I know the Lord will take care of you. No matter what the problems are, no matter what the burdens are, no matter how hard it gets, God will take care of you. I told you about Eve, but what I didn't tell you is that when she got to her wit's end, she cried out to God and God blessed her womb and gave her another son whose name was Seth. And Seth was the forefather of Jesus Christ. I told you about Hagar and how she was out of food and ready to die. But what I didn't tell you 
is that Hagar dropped on her knees in the wilderness and called on the God of Abraham and said, Lord, I'm out here with this boy. The Bible says God didn't hear her, but he heard the boy crying under the bush. And God sent an angel to Hagar and said, oh, Hagar, don't give up yet. There's some food on a rock just a quarter of a mile away. There's a brook down the road just a quarter mile away. I'm not going to let you starve, but I'm a God who will provide. I told you about Jacobeth with her little son Moses. She didn't know what to do, so she got some straw together, laid the straw out, put on a layer of tar, put on a layer of pitch, laid down a layer of love, put on another layer of tar, put on another layer of pitch, clothed the basket in compassion, laid a little baby in the basket, set him out on the Nile River, looked up to God and said, now Lord, now Lord, you told me if I need you, call you. And I'm calling you right now. It's not me that I'm praying for, but the boy you gave me, he's out on the water. You can go where I can't go. You can see what I can't see. I want you to watch over him, Lord. Wrap him up in your arms of love. Wrap him up with your long arms of compassion. Don't let my boy drown. God watched over Moses, led him to the Pharaoh's house. Moses had the best schools, the best training, the best clothes, the best of everything. But then one day, God called out to Moses, said, Moses, I didn't watch over you for your sake, but I watched over you for my sake. Moses, I've got something for you to do. Go down to Egypt land and tell on Pharaoh to let my people go. Moses delivered the children, but I told you about Mary standing at the foot of the cross watching her son die. He died on Friday till the grave got sick of the stomach, started to vomiting up its dead. He died until the moon ran down in blood. He died until the sun refused to shine, until the stars went out on strike. He died until the earth started to reeling and rocking like a drunk man went down into the grave stayed there Friday night stayed there Saturday morning but Saturday evening he said since I'm down here don't want to waste no time I guess I'll preach a while and the Bible says he preached to the spirits who were down in hell. Jesus ran a revival, took all the devil's folk, and Sunday morning, Mary's baby got up from the grave, stepped up on resurrection ground, and said, all, 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 all power, all power, Didn't he fix it? He fixed it on 
on a hill far away. He satisfied Micah's love. He justified Amos' justice. He corroborated Job's confidence. He cut loose Kant's categories. He satisfied Socrates' question. But more than that, he saved my soul. He healed my mind. He fixed my spirit and gave me joy. Joy, joy that the world can't give and the world can't take it away. Is he all right? I said, is the man all right? Have you ever tried him? Won't he make a way? Anybody here ever tried the Lord? Have you been sick? 